<laughs> All right, so let's start with our discussion from where we left and uh, we start looking at the methods where we can associate the passing method with the derivation of that. And we looked at four possibilities <coughs> and we are saying that if we draw a grid, let me start talking now. So we have synthesized vector groups and we had inherited vector groups and then we were looking at two parsing methods which are top down and bottom up parsing. And at least on one we agreed that when it comes to bottom up parsing and synthesized vector groups, this was something which was simple to do. And when it came to top down and inherited, then we said that at least in some cases we may be able to do it. That means if I only have inherited attributes and attributes <coughs> only are referring to nodes which have already been created. Okay? But we don't know how to do that. So this was slight question mark, but top down and synthesized was a big question mark and bottom up and inherited was another issue we did not understand. Okay? But since we have two passing methods and two kind of attributes, we cannot put a restriction on what kind of attribute equations a compiler writer may decide to use. Okay? We have to crack all these problems. Ultimately, the goal is that I should be able to put a tick in every box. Right? Okay? So let's look at at least the one which is the simplest, which is the bottom up and synthesized attributes only. And how do I now change my parser so that I can evaluate all the synthesized attributes? Because now we are talking of implementation, no longer just the specifications. Now, if you go back and recall, you had something called a state stack. What did state stack contain in a bottom of parser? States what visited so far which have not been reduced. Hmm? States visited so far which have not been reduced. Not states, I mean, whatever has been shifted. Whatever has been shifted is on the state stack. Okay? So we had some state symbols and we had some grammar symbols. Okay? Now state symbols are only capturing the information there. Okay? Now there are implementations where you will not have to worry about grammar symbols at all and you will just work with the state symbols because that's the only information you require. But assume that for logical reasons, we have all the information about the grammar symbols of the stack. Okay? When it is equivalent, so really it doesn't matter. Now suppose I have a rule like this, it says A goes to X, Y, this is my grammar rule and corresponding to this I have an attribute equation of the form which says that attribute of A is a function of attribute of X and an attribute of Y. And these are all now synthesized attributes because we are talking about S attribute definitions. Now we need to do this evaluation as we are going through the reduction. Now obviously before the reduction happens, what are the symbols, what will be the symbols, suppose this is my top of stack, okay. What will be my state, what will be the top two entries in the stack before this reduction happens. Hmm? What will be the symbols on the top of the state stack before reduction? X and Y. Right? And after reduction, I am going to pop these two symbols and I am going to push A on the stack. Now suppose in addition to state stack, I also have what we know as a value stack. So I am now looking at the implementation and corresponding to every symbol what I can do is I can have a value and a state in the same stack pointer. Okay. That means attributes of x can be kept here and attribute of y can be kept here okay. before reduction. Okay. And now when I do reduction 
what do I need to do? I need to take these two values and then I compute A using this function and then after reduction I just push attribute of A on the stack which is the value stack. <coughs> then my problem is solved because all I need to do is contain additional stack, uh, make an additional stack which contains all the values of the attributes and the same stack pointer will work for this and as I am pushing the symbol simultaneously in this stack I push the corresponding attribute. So how will my equations look? Okay. That now I can say that if this is the kind of equation I have, this is the kind of attribute equation I have for this grammar rule, if I want to write it in terms of value stack, what will I do? I will say that suppose I'm computing now value, which is value which will come at the new top, which will come here. How will I compute that? I'm just going to say that this is nothing but a function of value at the top and value at top minus 1. Okay. And what is new top? New top obviously is before reduction if I take top and if I then say that length of the right hand side is r then I have to reduce this top by r and then I have to add 1 to this. So if this is where my stack pointer was and this length is 2, then I subtract 2 from the stack pointer and add 1 to this to push this value of a here. Okay. And after reduction what happens? Top becomes, so this is before reduction. And this is after reduction top becomes new top. <coughs> so now I can take all my attribute equations and I can give an implementation in terms of the value stack. And now suppose they are symbols which do not have a corresponding attribute. Then what will I do? Hmm? Don't have to do anything. Just push another value. Right? So this is to begin with this is empty. If I find there is no corresponding attribute, I just leave that empty. Okay, so that I have the same stack pointer which is manipulating both state and the value stack. Will that work? Yes, no. This is clear how we implement at least this part that for synthesized attributes and bottom up parser, how can I implement this? Okay. Now some parsers may provide built-in facilities for this. Okay. So like parser like yeah will provide you all these dollar dollar mechanisms. But basically this is this remains the implementation. Okay. So this is how it happens that I'm going to evaluate all these attributes while I am parsing and whenever reduction is made value of the new synthesized attribute is computed from the attributes of the right hand side which are already on the stack. Okay? And then all we are going to do is we are going to extend the stack to hold the values. So I have a state stack and I have a value stack. State stack we have already seen when we were doing a bottom up parsing and value stack is what we introduce now and current top of stack is created by the pointer top. Okay? And then we say that if there is a kind of attribute equation I have and this is associated with some production, then before reducing x, y, z to a, value of z is in the top okay? and value of y is in top minus 1 and value of x is in top minus 2. Right? This is how it is going to be pushed, left hand side lower and the right hand side at the top of the stack. Okay? And if symbol has no attribute, then NP is just left as undefined. Okay? And after reduction, top is decremented by 2 and state, which covers A, which is now the left hand side of the production after reduction, that is push at top. Okay? So if this is the kind of grammar I have, okay, and this is one of the grammars I started with, suppose I was to write all the actions now in terms of the values. Okay? How will I do that? Want to have a crack at it? Okay. 
So use the similar logic and write the rules here. So that you have already seen this example of desk calculator that when I do reduction by this rule, I want to have the value of the <coughs> expression. That means value of expression when I do this reduction, what will be at the top of the stack? Top of stack will contain L. <coughs> Everything has been reduced to the start symbol. And therefore, the value stack corresponding to that must have value of L. Okay? So what kind of action rules I will write here? Okay? What about this? When I say F is assigned to there is no FL now, there is only a stack, there are no attributes. Attributes have been changed into terms of the stack there. So don't get stuck to that FL, F pointer, F in, F out, no. Right? So talk only in terms of as if there is a value stack, there is a stack pointer, and then keep adding these values okay, on the stack. Okay? So what about this? Okay, let's see this. When I have this rule, Value stack doesn't change. Of course it does. There are three symbols on the right hand side. <coughs> Not one symbol. Top value is, so new top is, top minus one. So this is my stack, right? This is where the value of E is, right? And after I pop this, this, and this, this value should appear here, okay? So value of N top is going to be value of top minus one, that is before reduction, and after reduction, top is same as N top, right? And what is really N top? N top will be top minus three plus one, that is top minus two here, okay? So that is where the value will come after reduction. The new value will be here because after reduction, all these three symbols are going to be popped and F is going to be pushed here. Right? Okay. So this is how rules will appear that if I say for bracketed expression value of N top is going to be value of top minus 1 which is coming because of this because right bracket is on the top, this is at top minus 1, this is at top minus 2. Okay? What about this? Okay. Here I will say that n top is nothing but I will have to take top and I will have to take top minus 2 and multiply the two values. Okay. And what about this? Okay. Same thing but the multiplication will be replaced by addition. Okay. What about action of this, this and this? What will happen here? So what about action of this? E going to t. Hmm? So I have to do anything here? So I don't write any action here because what is happening here is that my stack is containing t and then this is value of t then I replace this by e. Okay? The value is the same. So I don't have to write an action at all. <coughs> so remember that in default when you had yak, dollar dollar is never assigned anything. There is a single reduction by default. What does what is the value of dollar dollar? Dollar one, right? Okay, that's the default value. So you don't have to write an action for that. Okay. So for rest of it, I don't write any value. And here I am just saying that print whatever is on top of this guy. Okay. So this is a unit reduction. This is a unit reduction. This is a unit reduction. And all that is happening is that whenever I am pushing digit on the stack, okay, I'm pushing digit well, that is the only attribute on the value stack. And when digit becomes f, what do I do? Nothing. Because now digit is being replaced by f and the only thing that is happening is that now the stack pointer is pointing to the same thing where the value of the digit is stored. Sir, uh, for that star do we explicitly store a null value in the value stack? What, uh, so you can assume that to begin with my stack contain only null values. So when I add star, I don't change it. So all everything is undefined, and that's it. So whenever I define a value, I initialize it, otherwise it remains undefined. Because I'll never access it. Right? So is implementation clear? 
Okay. So before reduction, top is n top is top minus r plus one, and after reduction, top is nothing but n top. Okay. And here is an example. We can go through this example of saying if this is the input we have, and if I want to look at my state stack and value stack and the production that is being used. Okay. Since you have already seen, you can see quickly that first I am going to put <coughs> digit on this state stack and the value is going to be 3. So this is the input which is going to be pushed here. Okay. This is the value stack and then I say digit goes to f and 3 remains here and this is the reduction and you can see that I have not used any rule here. Okay. And then I can say that I have t going to f, so t comes on the stack and 3 remains there and then star gets pushed on the stack and corresponding to that value stack contains a value which is undefined. So dash is undefined not minus. And then again digit comes on the stack. So 3 undefined 5 is the value stack. And then when I do a reduction by this rule, when this digit goes to f, my value stack remains the same. Okay. And then I will say that t star f gets reduced. So what will I do? Now I will say that 3 undefined 5 are going to be popped and 15 is going to be pushed on the stack. So that becomes value of t. Okay. And I can continue in the same manner and finally I am going to get value of e of the stack which is going to be 19 and when final reduction happens it says l goes to e followed by <laughs> new line symbol I am going to just print this value. Right. So exactly what I have done here. Is clear to everyone? Right. This part is clear. Right. Now let's come to this box, okay. where we say that I have a top-down parser and inherited attributes, okay. and we started some discussion on this. Okay. And let me then just try to refresh your memories on what we are trying to do here. Okay. So first thing it appears is that if I use a top-down parser and I'm dealing with inherited attributes, okay, then I should be able to do parsing and I should be able to simultaneously evaluate all my attributes. Okay. Except a small catch and the catch is that when I say that A is, let's say I have a production of this form, A goes to x, y, z. Okay. Top -down, in top-down parser, this is how my parse tree is going to get created. Okay. And now if I look at inherited attributes, the way I am defining my inherited attributes are that inherited attribute of a symbol can be defined in terms of inherited attribute of its parent node and attributes of its siblings. Okay. That means potentially I can now write an equation which says x inherited is a function of a, y and z, some attributes of a, y and z. As far as my inherited attribute definitions are concerned, this is a valid equation. Okay. Except the catch that even when I start constructing my parse tree, what will happen is that I said that I am going to expand the leftmost non terminal all the time. Okay. Therefore, before I go and start expanding this part, I will say, let me go and expand this. Okay. And I will keep on expanding this tree till I hit the leaf nodes. And then only I will come and start expanding this. Okay. Now if I say that I want to compute inherited attribute of x in terms of some attribute of y, okay, node corresponding to y has not even been created okay, and therefore those attributes are not available to me. Okay. Now suppose I restrict my definitions such that if I have an equation like this or let me slightly change it, so let me keep this part here okay, and let me this part of the board. Suppose my I have an attribute equation of this form. Or I have grammar rule of this form. And now I say that for any xi, okay, if I am computing <coughs> attributes, it can only be a function of inherited attribute of A and any attribute, attribute of any symbol on the left hand side. That means x1 up to x i minus 1. Okay. Now, also what is important to note here is 
But I am saying that as far as parent node is concerned, I can only use inherited attribute of the parent node and as far as x1 to xi minus 1 are concerned, I can use either inherited or synthesized attributes of this. Okay. Then, doesn't matter, in top-down parser, if the, I restrict my equations to this form, then I will always be able to compute xi. I will never get into a problem. Because I am now saying that all my attributes have already been computed. Okay? Remember that I cannot violate my dependence law. Okay? So these are known as L attributed definitions. Okay? So now I am restricting my class of inherited attributes to L attributed definitions and saying that I can compute this in certain manner and when translation takes place during parsing, order of evaluation is going to be linked to order in which the nodes are created and that is really the order that I am creating my nodes starting from the left and that is really the parsing order and which is the for both whether it is top down or bottom up that is the depth first reversal order. Okay. If I make this restriction then I say that L attributed definitions are where attributes can be evaluated in depth first reversal order. So I am now restricting my class of languages once again and saying that if I have only L attributed definitions, then I can do this computation. If I have general attribute equations, then I can. Okay? So, L attributed definitions are that if I have an attribute, a, a production of this form, okay, then we say that attributes of any symbol, they depend only on if I take xj, then xj which is lying somewhere between 1 and n. The inherited attribute of xj depends only on inherited attribute of a and attributes of x1 to x j minus 1. This is j minus 1. I mean, this font is not very clear, not i minus 1. Yeah. So now if we look at the trans okay. So if we look at let's say this, okay. So here is a production and here are some attribute equations. So first question, is this L attributed? So let us look at this. If I say L inherited is a function of A inherited, that is fine, it does not violate anything. Then I say M inherited is a function of L synthesized. Is that okay? Yes, no. That is fine because it is looking at attribute of left hand side. Doesn't matter whether left sibling, this is in terms of the inherited attribute or synthesized attribute of the left sibling. This is an attribute of the left sibling. So please remember definition once again. I am saying that inherited attribute of the parent and all attributes of the left siblings, okay, whether it is inherited or synthesized, doesn't matter. Okay. So this is fine. If I look at A synthesized, which is a function of M synthesized, that also is okay. There is no problem with that. Okay. So this definition is L attributed definition. Okay. Uh, what about this? If I have a rule like this, which says if a production says A goes to QR and there is an attribute equation which says R inherited is a function of A inherited, is that okay? Any violations of L attributed definitions here? Now, what about this? Q inherited is a function of R synthesized. No means what? It is a violation of L attributed definition because now inherited attribute of Q is being defined in terms of attributes of a right sibling. Okay? So this is not L attributed definition. And if I look at A synthesized which is a function of Q synthesized, that is fine. Okay? There is no problem. Okay? Now you can see that as far as if I restrict my inherited attributes to N attributes, okay, then I can even do this. Then I can write a top down parser by restricting this. So although this was a question mark, but we know that now this can be at least conceptually done. Okay, we see how to do it, but at least conceptually this problem is gone that I am dealing with a situation where I have certain attributes which are not even present. Right? So at least one more box has been cracked. Okay, we will see how to crack other two boxes, but at least this part is clear. Okay. So let me introduce now a new notion. Okay. Remember in the beginning I talked about two ways of writing your attribute equations. One was 
I had certain attributes which are only specifications. Okay? So I have only had attribute equations, but I also said that we are going to have something known as translation scheme, where I have attribute equations, but I'll try to impose an evaluation order on those attribute equations. Okay? And these are not going to be pure specifications, but they will try to capture the implementation some way. Okay? So this, these are called translation schemes, and basically translation scheme is nothing but same attribute equations, but now I am putting these attribute equations not just on the right hand side like some specifications, but I can put them anywhere on the right hand side between the grammar symbols also. Okay? So I can have something like this that I can write a production like this and then I can say a translation scheme may have x1, x2 and then some action 1 and x3 and so on. Okay? So you can see that here I am forcing some action which is a code or which is an attribute equation in the middle of the grammar symbols, not just the right hand side. Okay. But let's see what power, what additional power it gives me because now I am saying that I am actually doing something with the implementation. Okay. Now, way I am doing this or the motivation for doing this is, I will say that as I go through this creation of the parse tree, then at this point of time, I don't want to wait till I have seen all the symbols to evaluate an attribute equation. I want to evaluate this attribute equation right here as soon as I encounter it. Okay? So this is really forcing an evaluation order. This is saying that do evaluations at certain points of time and not only at the end. Okay? So here is a small grammar and can you see the strings which are being generated by this grammar? <coughs> You can see that my start symbol is a term followed by rest of it and term is a number and what is rest of it? Rest of it is some operator which is an additional operation followed by a term and followed by rest of it. Okay? So you can see that this is a right recursive grammar, this is a right heavy tree and finally how will I terminate my production by saying that R goes to a sign. Okay? So what it gives me R if I say add op is plus or minus, this is giving me some infix expression. This is creating now a parse tree for expression where numbers are separated by plus or minus. Okay? So really you can write things like c plus 4 minus 5 let's say. Okay? Where I am assuming at top is only plus or minus. Okay? These are the kind of strings which can be generated by this. Okay? And it is easy to see that what will be the Pass B for this, this will be E going to T and R and T will go to then 3, R will be plus <coughs> T and R and this T will go to 4 and then this will be minus T and R and this T will go to 5 and this R will go to epsilon. This is the kind of pass B we get. Now what we want to do is, we want to, when, so one, one kind of problem we looked at was that when we reach at the top, when we reduce by this symbol, at that point of time we want to say that whatever is the value that should be printed. Now I am changing the problem slightly and I am changing the problem to say that whenever I reach the top, whenever I do this reduction, at that point of time equivalent infix, instead of infix, or uh, let us say postfix expression will be printed. Okay? So what will be postfix of this? Right, that is going to look. So all I need, all you need to do is take this expression tree and then just do a post order traversal. Right. So this is the post fix, and what I want now is that I want to now whenever I reach the start symbol, I want to print this, not the value. Okay. So there is another problem. So as I said, attribute equations are really for solving certain problems. Okay? So what we do here now is that we want to use the mechanism of translation scheme and I want to add certain actions in the middle of the grammar. Okay? So let us create some space for adding action and let me add an action here which I say that I want to print ad here. Okay? 
and then I am adding another action. Now action can be anywhere. It could be in the rightmost position, it could be in the leftmost position, or between two grammar symbols. Okay. So I have added two actions here. One is here which says print add op, and another is here which says print now. Okay. And now let me take you to implementation of this. So what you want to do to begin with is that let me say that each of these actions is going to be treated as a dummy grammar symbol. A leaf node of course, okay. it cannot be a non-terminal, it can only be a terminal, but it is treated like a grammar symbol. And I create my parse tree in the same manner. Okay. So if I now say that I want to parse, let's say 9 minus 5 plus 2, and I want to print a postfix for this, first thing I will do is I will create this parse tree. Okay. So this is the parse tree for 9 minus 5 plus 2. Okay. I have already seen this. Okay. Now if I say that this is also being treated as a leaf node, a token, okay. then my pass tree will change and my pass tree will change by putting this action because now I am saying that t goes to num followed by this print num. Print num now is a dummy leaf node. Okay. So this is how it will change that t goes to num and print num. At this point of time, I am not executing any action but I am saying that this is just a leaf node. <coughs> And similarly, I will put for all t's okay, a print num, and for all these productions which says r goes to minus t r, I had introduced an action here which said r goes to minus t print add op followed by r. Okay, uh, print add op here and a print add op here. Okay, this is how my parse tree will. Okay, so I have taken this parse tree and I have introduced corresponding actions also as leaf nodes. Yes. Okay. Now suppose I do a depth first traversal of this tree, and whenever I encounter a leaf node correspond, corresponding to an action, I execute. So what will happen now? What will be the first node that will get printed? Nine, then five, then minus, then two, and then plus. Is that the postfix? I have got the postfix out of it. So now I am using slightly different mechanism. I am actually talking about a implementation. I am saying that, so why implementation and translation schemes are important? Because now I am saying that I want to execute these actions at certain points. Okay. I am not just leaving it to specification, but I know precisely at a location where I say that now I want to execute it. Execute it now, execute it now, execute it now. And if I keep on doing those executions, then my job is done. <coughs> now let's see how do I implement translation scheme because at this point of time I mean we really don't want to create this parse tree and then have another traversal. Whole idea was that I should be able to do all these translations as I'm parsing. So I don't want to create parse tree first and then say that these dummy nodes are part of the parse tree, then traverse parse tree once again and then execute these dummy nodes. That's really not the intent. That's only the logic. Okay? Intent is really to go into the implementation. So I should be able to now have this implementation. Okay? So what we are assuming here are actions are nothing but terminal symbols and when I perform a depth first traversal order to obtain, when I perform depth first traversal order, whenever I reach this action that <coughs> whenever I reach this terminal symbol corresponding action is going to get executed and when we design translation schemes we therefore have to ensure that when I say that print num here, this value of num is available. Okay? Suppose I put it at a wrong place. Okay. and value of num is not available, then what will happen? My data dependence block will get violated. So I have certain data dependencies, remember? So that will get violated if I don't put my action at the right place. Okay. So when I said, for example, I was trying to parse an expression grammar, I was trying to parse not an, what was that grammar? It was not an expression grammar. That was a declaration, right? A declaration of type followed by a list. Okay. So when I was trying to parse that string in some way I said, L inherited is P type. Okay. Now L inherited is P type, there is a dependence there. It says that it depends on P type and unless P type has been evaluated, I really cannot evaluate this equation. So this equation cannot be arbitrarily evaluated at any point of time, but it can be evaluated only at the position P type becomes available. Okay. So for example, if I say print num here, instead of this print num, I put it somewhere else, by then value of num may have changed. So that will really be not the right place to do that. So finding out the right place okay, is very important in translation schemes. 
Okay. Now let me pick up another example. So suppose I have a production of this form. Okay. And I want to compute, let's say I have two equations with this. I have some computation of A inherited, okay, which is function of something, and I have a computation of B inherited, okay, which is let's say function f1, function f2. Okay. These are my attributes. And I want to convert this into a translation. Where should I compute a inherited because now I want to put an action here, here, here. I have multiple places where I can put actions. So if I say S goes to A, B, where should I? I have these three places where I can put actions. Where should I put A inherited computation? This box, this box, or this box? And you will also have to give me a logic why we are putting it somewhere. So where should I put this? Middle one. This one? Right? Okay. So this is where I compute A inherited. And where do I compute B inherited? Here. Is that right? Is this okay? Everyone agrees with this? Okay, very good. So now let's try to make a parse tree and let's see whether it works or not. Okay. So suppose A and B are also non-terminals. In general, they can be. So let's say that now I have productions which says A goes to small a and B goes to small b. Okay? And then I say that here, so I am now computing some attribute, I can compute attribute for this a. Okay? So now I compute an attribute for this a and I say that this is a function of a inherited. Is that a valid equation? Because this is defined <coughs> in terms of its inherited attributes of the parent mode. Is that fine? Okay? So if that is correct, then what will happen? Let's look at my parse tree. My parse tree will look something like this. I'll have A, I'll have B, this goes to A, this goes to B. These are the kind of strings I'll generate. And then I say, here I'm computing A inherited, right? This is where you suggested between A and B. And now I say, an equation corresponding to this is saying that A goes to A i, which is a function of <coughs> Inherited. Will this work? In that first reversal order, I will reach this node and say, give me value of AI, but AI has not been computed as yet. This won't work. Right? You see the problem? Why I am not able to compute AI in the second position? Now, what does AI depend upon? A inherited depends only on the siblings of its or on the attributes of its <coughs> left siblings. Okay? So why I can't compute A inherited here? Does it prevent me from doing any computation here? Can I compute A inherited here? Yes. Okay. So if I compute A inherited here, okay, then I don't have to worry about this problem because in that case what will happen is that I will now compute A inherited at this place. And in that first reversal order, when I say, now give me this value, okay, this value has already been computed. Okay. So thumb rule is, whenever you have inherited attribute, compute it in the position on the immediately left of the grammar symbol. Then I will not have a problem at all. Okay. So when I am trying to compute A inherited and B inherited, they must be computed in the place which is immediately to the left of A and immediately to the left of B. What about synthesized attribute? Because in any attributed definitions, I can have both inherited and synthesized attributes. So what are the places where I can compute synthesized attributes? Can I compute <coughs> here, here, or here? What are the right places? Right of what? Right of the symbol. No. So 
So suppose I want to compute A synthesizer, where should I compute? After? After A. I will not compute A synthesized in this grammar rule at all. I will compute A synthesized only in the grammar rule on which A is on the left hand side. Because A synthesized depends only on its children nodes. Right? So I can compute A synthesized there. Why should I compute A synthesized here? Those grammar symbols are not available to me. If I say I want to compute A synthesized, what are the kind of equations you are going to write? You will say A synthesized is a function of and these are attributes of children node of A. Do I have access to children node of A here? So how can I compute A synthesized here? After small A. Yes. So I will always compute A synthesized in a rule in which A occurs on the left. Okay. And in this equation I can only compute S synthesized. Right? And where can I compute S synthesized? What should be the position of A synthesized computation? The rightmost position. So thumb rule is that all synthesized attributes must be computed in the rightmost position and all inherited as attributes must be computed in the position immediately to the left of the grammar symbol. Then I never have problem of evaluation of Right? Is this point clear? Okay. So if I just do these computations, okay, then I can handle my attribute equations without violating any of the dependence problems. Okay. So, in case of synthesized attribute, this is trivial because I am computing synthesized attribute in the rightmost position. But in case of both inherited and synthesized attributes, <coughs> inherited attribute of a symbol on the right hand side must be computed in the action before that symbol, immediately left of this. So, if this is the kind of attribute equations I have, okay, you can see that when I make a pass tree like this okay, and I put all attributes in this position when I am saying that I want to print A1 inherited. A1 inherited has not even been initialized and therefore A1 inherited should have been computed in this position which is immediately on the left of A. Then I would not have gotten into any of these violations. Similarly, A2 inherited must have been computed on the left of A, then this equation would have been fine. Okay? So depth first traversal order in this case is going to give an undefined error and synthesized attribute for non-terminal on the left hand side can be computed after all the attributes of the reference have been computed and action normally should be placed at the end of right hand side. Okay? And inherit it is immediately on the left. Okay? So now let us look at a translation scheme and try to create a translation scheme and suppose this is the, uh, okay, let us write this first. Okay? Let me give you now a specification and what I will ask you to do is, I will ask you to compute the translation scheme or write the translation scheme for this. This actually is a grammar for equation type center system which says that start symbol is a block, a block can consist of two consecutive blocks or a block can consist of a block and subscript another block. So, it is like saying that if I am trying, trying to do type setting, I can have two blocks and I can put them next to each other, I can have a block and then I can have a subscript block to this. Okay? Only thing that happens in case of subscript block is that the font size of this will be smaller. Okay, so, you can say that subscript is going to be 75 percent smaller than this font size and this will be slightly displaced, uh, displaced okay? so that now the total height of the block changes okay? and this is the kind of computation I am trying to do that if I say that my font size is an inherited attribute, okay, so I have two kind of attributes now, so let me remove synthesized attribute. If I say that my point size is an inherited attribute, so when I start doing typesetting system, I say that I want to typeset this document in 10 point size. Okay. We have done enough of data to know this. Okay. That right in the beginning you declare the font size and then you say that b1 point size and b2 point size are determined by this. So, b1 point size is b point size and b2 point size is b point size. Okay. But when it comes to a rule like this which says that b is a block which consists of b1 and a subscript block b2, then b1 point size is same as b point size but b2 point size is slightly smaller and depending on your type setting system you will have a shrink factor. Okay? So, shrinking may be like 75 percent, 80 percent, 70 percent does not matter and therefore, we use this function 
Now, what will be really the height? Okay. So, there we will say that the height of this text is going to be b height is going to be determined by the text height multiplied by point size. So, some function there, right? And then how will I determine height of this b? Now, you can see that I have height of b1 and I have height of b2, but slight displacement. So, total height will actually go up, and therefore, we say that b height is nothing but with some displacement, okay. So, you one can determine what is the displacement factor, whether you want to align it in the middle and so on, okay. But the total height is going to be more than height of b1 and b2, and therefore, I say that b height is displacement of some b1 height and b2 height, some displacement function. What about b height here? b height is going to be simple that whatever is the max of the two, okay, that will become the b height. I mean, assuming that at least there is going to be alignment at one position. And then, what is the height of the start symbol or the whole text? That is going to be the b height here, right? Now, suppose I want to con convert this into a translation scheme. That means I want to put all the attribute equations in a place that I will not have any violation of evaluation. Whenever I am trying to do that computation, all the attribute it depends upon will be available to me. No such violation will take place. Where should I put? all these inherited attributes, synthesized attribute will remain in the rightmost position that we have agreed. So, where should I put this equation if I am writing a translation scheme? Where will this go? B point size is assigned 10, left of B. So, my attribute equation should look something like this after <coughs> converting this into a translation scheme, it should be something like saying that b point size is 10 that becomes the action and then I have b and then I say that s height is b height, right? This is how it is. What about this? How will this equation change? This rule and these equations in terms of translation scheme, how will they look? B goes through B1 point size is sign B point size followed by B1 followed by B2 point size is sign B point size followed by B2 followed by B height is <coughs> max of this becomes my translation, right? Okay. Similarly, so now I can do the same thing here. Okay, I evaluate it on the left hand side. So the way to read this is left to right, top to bottom. So I evaluate B one on left of. B1 point size on left of B1, B2 point size on left of B2, and then this at the end. And similarly, B1 point size on left of B1, and B2 point size on left of B2, and this, and then this is my translation. Okay. Now, let me pose a question to you. Okay. Suppose I, instead of this, I say evaluate it here. Okay. Does it change anything? Will I always be able to do this evaluation? Why not? Well, what it is in the attributes are dependent on the one also. No, by attributes are written right here, right? In this case, it may not matter. Okay. But we cannot have a general rule, and therefore, rather than looking at what are the attributes it depends upon. We have a general rule which says that compute it always on the immediately left of the grammar symbol. So, you do not have to look at what does it depend upon, okay. Because in this case, now you are saying, oh, it depends only on the inherited attribute and therefore of the parent and therefore I could have computed, okay. But then it will change from case to case, okay. And therefore, I do not want to take that kind of analysis and I will say that always compute this equation on left of B1 and this equation on left of B2 and so on, okay? And then I am good. Then I won't have now that we understand translation schemes, okay, 
we are going to attack these two problems. We are going to attack this box and this box and say that with the help of translation schemes, can I now use L attributed definitions for a bottom up parser and synthesize definitions for a top down parser? Right? These two boxes were left. In these two we have understood. So now we are going to attack these problems. Okay, so let's stop here today. And this we will take up in the week that follows the medicine exam. Okay? Right.